we're back. That's all that needs to be said. Welcome back to Money Never Sleeps. Feels great to say that. I'm joined today with my friend, Mr. House. Before we get into anything, just a reminder that nothing we say is financial advice. We're just a couple of guys who love talking about the markets. That includes J Webb, our our friend who will be here maybe next week. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we're back here. We're all together. The markets are still intact, even though every time we leave, it seems like it's gonna fall apart. But uh yeah, not financial advisors. So do your own research, make your own decisions. We're just talking shit about what's going on and ranting about things that we like or we hate house how are we doing today it's a wonderful tuesday market's already been open for two days what's on your mind i mean just number go up that's that's what's on my mind this week against against all odds and uh i think i'm I think i'm flipping I'm, I'm flipping full full bull for at least the next six months i mean it's it's there's just no denying it at this point so uh always a good day when green's on the board Definitely. And I I share your sentiment to an extent. I am bullish on Bitcoin, I think, in the short term. I think that there's a lot of things that are lining up for it that could have a bit of a run here, maybe to all-time highs, which I honestly think is possible. There are things that I do have reservations about, but we'll get into that when we talk about crypto. I do want to start with some of the numbers from the Jules report today, because we did get them in, and we haven't seen this big of a drop since i believe 2020 february of 2020 so it's a very interesting number to look at i could be wrong about that date i know that there's three dates from 2000 where you have significant drops in the jolts i believe it was 2008 2020 and i believe this is the third one where it's the most significant drop since so i'm going to pull yeah, this think, up on the screen i think this is i read it as it's the lowest level since february 2021 but one of the lowest of the millennium 2000 Ahead. That's what it is. Yep. I, yep. You're right. But the U.S. Jolts job report openings actually 8.059 million. Forecast was 8.35 million. Previous was 8.48 million. Provides obviously uh, went up just a little bit from the previous reading. Now, this is pretty big because it shows you that companies are not hiring. They are not hiring. We're seeing just jobs across the board kind of going. You know, we're, we're seeing tons of layoffs in the past few months, right? In, in the month of May, we had 96,000 layoffs that were recorded. That's according to Macro Edge. They do a great job of tracking all that data. But we're starting to see these companies either unwilling to hire because they're trying to save on cash or they're afraid to hire because they just aren't really sure of the direction of this market. So they're just like, let's get lean. You know, it's good to have some reserves. We can't borrow from these banks at uh, cheap rates like we did back in 2000, uh, 2020 when rates were at 0%. So it's like, you know, if this is a bull market, then maybe we do want to have a little bit of cash on hand. And once we get that green light, you know, we have some money that we can deploy. Right now, we're not seeing that. The Federal Reserve's policy remains steadfast, you know, higher for longer. I did see that some Fed presidents are looking at maybe easing a bit here. We're seeing the bond market kind of react to it. I'm not convinced uh, anyone really knows what's going on here. I'm convinced I know what's going on just because of what we're seeing in global markets and some of the reactions that we're seeing in other economies. But I think it's all leading to one funnel. And it kind of begs the question that I have for you is, do you think we're in a new market cycle where if there is any type of major pullback, say a black swan or anything, does it always have to crash from all time highs? Because it never used to be the case, but now recently seems like it gets kind of scary around these all-time highs i think that's i don't know that we're fully in a new cycle yet i'd say that we're kind of in the same cycle that we have been since march and kind of late q1 of this year um but it seems like as far as crashing from all-time highs that seems to be where crypto has been headed recently, right? As we get in these up only trends and there's like, you know, a five, 10% drop off, then it quests and hikes backs up. Um, but as far as the rest of the market, I mean, if you're talking about tech all time highs, right? Like you've seen Nvidia just absolutely baffle Moore's law and just grow exponentially in the past few years. Um, so I think to that end, yes, 
But I think looking at the market holistically, you know, not everything's at all time highs. We've been seeing some industry struggle and just be held up by that, you know, that FANG and NVIDIA group. So uh, I think for the, you know, for the high tech sector, yes, probably, because that's what's reaching for all time highs. But, you know, I think that's just where we're at in the market is there's so much dependence on tech, you know, especially looking at AI, microconductors and chips. Um, and that's just where a lot of the world's dependence is right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really good assessment of two things. One, obviously, where the market kind of wants to focus its energy and deploy capital towards. Obviously, it's, you know, AI, it's been the narrative. We're also seeing a lot of money just kind of flow into these uh, these remaining producers of returns and beating earnings, these major, these major companies, right? But you also brought up a great point how a lot of the market isn't up near all-time highs. It's actually quite far off of it, right? And we have this disconnect between consumers who are absolutely strapped for cash and in a lot of pain. And then we see, you know, a lot of these companies that are still doing well, NVIDIA, right? I'm wondering at one point if, because I, I, I still can't buy into the fact that we're in a full bull market. I think that we had a bullish run. I completely agree with that. You know, 2023, 2024, first half, amazing, amazing. Um but I, there's just too much in terms of not just monetary policy, but just how the monetary system works and global markets that can't convince me that we are going to a place where consumers, retail, you know, the middle class, middle class, if they do exist, are going to have enough money in order to continue to, to, you know, allow these companies to have these great returns. I'm seeing more of there's too much supply. So supply is chasing demand down to a, a newer price level where, Hopefully they're able to, uh, you know, some profits better than no profit whatsoever. So that's kind of the mentality I'm seeing here. My, I, I think the thing that scares me the most is that when you see these companies like Nvidia go into all time highs and you're seeing everything that divergence, is that what confusing people in terms of believing like wholeheartedly, like say Tom Funstrat who's saying bull market completely, or someone like me or uh, Chanos who's like, nah, this is absolutely like Great Depression level stuff that's coming. Well, I think it's I think it's a weird divide. Like, I think these these companies that are in these high scaling, high revenue margin areas, like the chip producers and like AI companies, they're making a killing while a lot of their vendors are. And I think one kind of you know niche corner, maybe even edge example of that is uh, on the latest Dell earnings call. Someone brought up, you know, storage. What's their bread and butter? That's why they bought EMC. You know, they were the storage kings back in the day, uh, and now the the storage that they're selling to AI, they're making no money on it, right? Like it's a revenue number, but their the margins are non-existent. Someone calls it out on their earnings call, and they just literally walk in circles around the answer for three minutes, and the guy's like, "Great, that's all I needed to hear." <laughs> yeah, did not did not go well for Dell. Um, no, I think I think that's just kind of a, a symptom of not, or not. I wouldn't even call it a symptom, but that's just kind of the market that we're in is these risk on or previously risk on areas that now are getting a lot of hype behind them, whether it's through the media or just, you know, rapid product update, like the leaps we made in generative AI and how user friendly it is and accessible is that's where all the attention is and everyone wants to put money into that rather than, rather than a diversified traditional strategy. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a great point. Um, let's talk about oil real quick. I didn't have that on the show's agenda, but this chart just intrigues me so much and it kind of scares me and it kind of makes me bullish on the rest of the market in the short term because of how oil has been performing in the short term. And if we look at this real quick, you can see that oil, you know, obviously had a really great run going into October. And then once the news, obviously, Israel Hamas, we probably expected this to rise significantly. We didn't get that. We continue to see oil drop. And then this is pretty much OPEC cuts, right? OPEC saying that they're going to get tougher, uh, you know, cut supply. Now we're at a very different place. We're seeing that, you know, the price of oil is at 73. We even put in a 72 handle early this morning. So what I'm concerned about is oil is starting to finally react to demands in the, in obviously in the global economy, which we you know a lot of this is 100% due to manufacturing being down across most uh, economies, you know, between Germany, uh, the US, you know, Asia specifically, we're starting to see that major slowdown, not necessarily as many people are also being employed. 
this summer is going to be really important and telling to see how much demand there actually is for oil. I think a lot of people will be traveling and stuff like that. Obviously, airlines, it's going to be really telling. We continue to see this drop into the summer. That's kind of my uh, base case right here that we're going to see oil continue to drop. But at what cost for lower gas prices by the time we get to the election? It might be something that people aren't necessarily excited about, right? That could 100% be a recession that's maybe acknowledged, or maybe it's just to the point where unemployment's well north of 4%. So I'm looking at this and seeing bearish signs because if we look back at 2008, and I'm just going to be an asshole and go to 2008 because that was the last major, major downturn when we saw you know unemployment rise significantly because of something in the financial system, not necessarily a pandemic or anything like that. We could see that we had a really good rise up, but once oil started turning over, it didn't stop, right? We just saw demand completely drop. And obviously there was a different time in the world when we're talking about 2008, uh, both in foreign affairs and also in the financial system. But we just continue to see this drop for the longest period of time. I mean, until literally the market bottom. And when the market bottomed right here, when you started seeing the supply zone kind of fill with oil, that's when literally it was the best time to buy in the market. Um, now, I say this because right now we're seeing that kind of come down to the point where, you know, right here, it's a pretty stark move. If we, I think if we lose the 67 handle, there's a very good chance that we could be rolling over significantly into November. And what does that mean in the short term? You know, especially this OPEX that I think that we're coming up to in, on June 21st kind of means that I think that the markets could run up a little bit here if this is a leading indicator to maybe downturn that is coming on the way, right? There's a lot of things that are building up in the market. And I believe that without some type of pressure release, you're just going to see something that will eventually break. And then everything that's happened for the past two years or so, even see four years, just bad mistakes, decisions that governments and uh, you know people in charge of financial institutions have made will come to haunt them and everything will just happen all at once, which is unfortunate. But with this and seeing oil drop here, I'm thinking that June 21st, we could see a lot running up into that. Um, obviously, one of them that's running up right now or was running up on Sunday night, GameStop, right? Have you been following it since he tweeted on, Saturday, uh, on Sunday night? A little bit. Um, I saw his his market position, and I think that that definitely stumped a lot of people because, I mean, I think a lot of people were convinced that you know he was done after the 2020 2021 craze. He probably sold all of his position, lost some of it, um, and I think there are probably a lot of people doubting that it was him because some people were even saying you know he sold the Twitter account and someone else. So the fact that he's had this much conviction, I mean, that dude, dude's, dude's made some bank, but no, I haven't, I haven't for the most part been following it. I, uh, I, I stray away from the, the WSB community, um, nothing against them. I just, I don't go in the Reddit subreddit. I don't follow them on Twitter. It's uh it's not my style of investment, so to speak. I think I completely agree with you. Right. And the reason I don't like the wall street bets, and I'm not saying the community itself, but just what's happening here is that everyone's calling this guy. I mean, they're kind of idolizing Keith Gill, right? Roaring kitty. And that's fine. I don't believe in false idols or anything like that. You know, in this market, you can't trust anyone. You have to have your back to the wall and make sure your hands are over your pockets because everyone will fucking try and come in for your money. But when I'm looking at this here, my problem with it is that the, when the tweets started, it happened on the Sunday night market open. And we saw a ton of people buy on Friday that uh, tons of contracts calls that Friday before. Tweets again on a Sunday night, right? Everyone gets excited. You see these Robin Hood hours start shooting up. Then you start to see trading get halted on those Mondays, and it keeps being limit down, limit down, limit down, right? I don't think people realize that this guy, I mean, I'm not saying he's doing it specifically, but people who also were in on it, because I don't think it's just him. I think there's also institutions that are definitely having their hand at this. 100%. I can't remember who tweeted it um but someone tweeted out a pretty good analysis of how much volume was traded on the initial return of roaring kitty and how much size had moved and it was essentially a number someone somewhere so large in the billions that like retail buyers even levered up could not have moved that much size and caused the caused the price fluctuation so it literally had to have been institutions also acting in the market on GME. So it's probably them, you know, learning from 
the mistake of the last turn where they're like, retail can't push this. They can't squeeze it. It's like, ah, they did. So yeah, no, they've, they've definitely wisened up. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's almost too perfect to the point where retail is getting sucked in at the worst possible time. Right. Because when was the time to buy it? Probably right before he tweeted on Friday, right? Buy it when it was nice and cheap. It bottomed out at like $25 a share. Sunday night, he tweets it, and then everyone's buying it Monday morning at 40 And if you keep doing this, I mean, you're offering these institutions that it bought on Friday because it's not just Keith Gill. It's all these – they they kind of learn the pattern. You can see this pattern mm-hmm. play out identical. I mean, I'm going to pull this up right here. I mean, this pattern is literally identical right here to what we freaking saw right here. Right, it bottomed out, and then it started shooting up again. And and the reason why it keeps shooting up here is because a lot of these institutions got out of the trade, and then they got in the trade again. And they, and that's why you got to watch out for these weekends and Fridays into Monday mornings because that's where all the plays are made. And they're smart and they wisen up. And then you know, come Monday morning, bullish as shit, right? Until it's not. That's that's kind of my assessment here. So I think that the first flush that happened with GME already happened. Now institutions are definitely in on this. Uh, it might not happen today, but closer to that June 21st OPEX, could be a chance that this could run up. Uh, and, and again, I'm not. that doesn't mean I'm bullish. You know, like I'm going to go all in on this shit. I'm not touching GameStop one bit. I, it's just I don't have the balls to be playing around with this game, uh, especially when it comes to these meme stocks. And I know that this is a losing battle that I should have got in down here at $11 instead of, you know, what is it at right now, $27. It's, it's not something I want to be playing. But that being said, you're sucking retail in into this OPEX state when everything is very close to all time highs. And that very much concerns me because I know that after one of these OPEXs, there's a good chance you could see the volatility swing shift. I just don't know when it is. And again, with retail running out of money, more and more money, you get something like this in the market, you're not going to get a ton of people that are coming in that have the money to deploy capital and, you know, distribute some of these overpriced stocks to them because they think they're going to get rich, but there's probably more now than there was a few months ago or even a few weeks ago when, uh, you know, Roaring Kitty hadn't tweeted yet. People think they're going to get rich and that this is a new bull market because he came back. I don't know if that's just a short-term squeeze or if we're actually going forward into that, but the, a lot of things are just pointing to me that you're probably going to see a bit of a pump. And if they've learned from this pattern, what happens afterwards? Well, obviously there's a pretty good dump that comes after it. I mean, let's say we pump into the OPEX. It still went down 65%, you know, a week and a half later. So something just to keep in mind. Um, I do want to do well, two things real quick. Oh, go ahead. Well, I'll just add, I think the other part of it too, that's very, very different from the COVID GameStop meme stock craze is we're not getting handed free money every week and every month now, right? Like back then, no rates, everyone's getting handed free money. It's completely risk on. So I think just to add to that, it's not only – is not everyone savvy enough to trade the right way and follow you know the patterns of the institutions and smart money are trading at but also like they're not getting that free government stimmy so you know dollars dollars lost are actual dollars lost not just oh, okay i'm gonna get my 800 dollars again next week and i can try it again so it's right. uh you know it's more real and it's not the uh you can't you don't have the same diamond hands hodl mentality because it's not free money it's your own money that you worked for Absolutely. That's a great point. And also kind of lines up with the next point. So I'm glad you brought that up is something that we're seeing in the banks. Uh, FDIC, obviously there's, this has been going around uh, yesterday. I was on a flight and then I, I got the text, but U S banks have unrealized loss on investment securities worth 517 billion, 39 billion increase from the previous quarter. So this is Q1. They added $39 billion, right? I believe there's, speculation that 63 banks are near insolvency risk on the verge of it or so everyone's saying well it's only 39 billion dollars i'm like i completely agree it's only 39 billion dollars to a 517 billion dollar you can find that money fairly easily the problem is that's just q1 we're in q2 right now and rates are still five and a half five five and a quarter um and that begs the question too of why if, if retail is not getting in, you have to distribute to them in order to see that transfer of wealth. Obviously, that's that's how it tends to be where markets where retail is the last one to come in and buy. Who are you distributing to? Right. That's the thing that scares me because the banks aren't issuing money. And if they are issuing money, it ain't, it ain't cheap one bit. Like I said, 2020, zero percent interest rates. The rich got rich. Uh, you know, a lot of people who were weren't wise and didn't have a lot of money couldn't have borrowed at those rates and then paid back at those rates. 
Now, maybe they borrowed when the rates were 2.5%. Maybe they borrowed when the rates were 4%, 5%. Getting a little crazy there. Um, you're not going to be able to pay off a lot of that back. So that's my main question when I see this. Obviously, I know the banks are in, are in shit condition. We, I think we've talked about that ad nauseum for, uh, for the past year or so. But this pointing towards pretty good chance that we could start to see some of these banks collapse, especially if you see the FDIC come out and say this, right? They're not going to want to say anything. It's almost like the Fed saying that there, there's bad financial conditions, right? They're not going to say anything. The Fed specifically isn't going to say anything bad because if they do, they think that they're going to cause a major crash, right? So by them saying that everything's okay, that they're, they're optimistic about the future, then the market itself, they believe can kind of sort itself out. And if it does crash, then so be it. But we weren't the reason that why it crashed, right? That's FDIC coming out and saying this, releasing this information. You know, you have to think that there's definitely some people that are like speculating that these banks are, are going to go bust fairly soon. Maybe, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next month, next six to 12 months, you might start to see one or two roll over. So I think that's this is a really big thing that they need to be uh, focusing on, and we've covered it. I, I'm going to pat ourselves on the back because we know that just because there's a lot of quiet, uh, there's a lot of quiet out there. We we were looking at the bank term funding program. It wasn't getting paid. A lot of that collateral went bust. Like it was actually bad collateral. And guess what? Um, there's no there's no money being issued right now. Rates are still five and a half, five and a quarter. It's only going to get worse the longer we stay up here. Yeah, no, and I think you know. If you look at, uh, I think it was actually you who sent it to me yesterday. At the same time that we have this going, you know, Berkshire Hathaway announces they've recently acquired another $150 billion worth of treasury bills. So it's, yeah. you know, granted, some people will judge them because they're not the most technologically forward investors, uh, you know, and they've been, they've been resistant to change. But at the end of the day, you know, if you see volatility incoming, what do you do? you buy government-backed securities because you're essentially saying as long as the government doesn't go bankrupt, which government money printer goes burr. So yeah, no, yeah. I mean, it's like, it's, it's obviously it's not a definite we've, we've been putting out some cracks that are worrying us, but I mean, at this point, I'm, I'm just so bewildered uh, that I'm, I'm embracing the up only until at least September. And then, uh, okay. you know, Q3 swings around, then, then I'll start, you know, reconsidering, but, um, I think that the one swinging point for me is, do we see a rate cut? Because if rates do go down for whatever reason, people are going to be more risk on than they already are. Yeah. And maybe that's the thing that we need. We need retail to come in for the distribution to go forth, right? It's been it's been very slow, but I think that when it does happen, it's going to be all at once, right? You can only take so many Jenga pieces out before you're forced to collapse the house. Mm -hmm. We'll look at this last thing here. Um, I just want to look at funding rates for crypto because it kind of goes hand in hand with what we're seeing. Funding rates are positive, right? We're looking at this here, fairly red. Obviously, a few are green on the various exchanges, but for the most part, people are long in crypto. Don't think that's necessarily wrong, especially when we look at some of the charts, primarily Bitcoin's. I think Bitcoin's chart is pretty telling that, all right, this was a little bull flag and we're breaking out of it right now. And once we get to the top of the channel, well, it's pretty much guaranteed all-time highs. I do think that there is some resistance, and I'll, I'll pull up the Coinbase chart after we look at this one right here, that if that holds, maybe it is that scenario where, you know, if there is a crash, it happens from all-time highs. Bitcoin 71,000 as we speak right now. Um, pull it, here it is. Obviously, this is the bull flag that I thought we were in. I was thinking they were trending down. If we broke out of this to the downside, then obviously this was a fake out. But right now, I think we got a little bit of room to the upside. I mean, I'm looking at wait one, three. I think we're in a wave five that could push us up a little bit higher. Um, and that's just for short term. I think that's going to lead us into obviously OPEX June 21st. Now that we know that Bitcoin is part of uh, traditional finance with all these ETFs out there, I think they kind of coincide with one another. And it's going to be very interesting for these next two weeks or so before we get some of that information. But uh, your thoughts on this? No, yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I think I'm pretty much in agreement. Um, you know, I think right now I could see Bitcoin in the next week or so, probably, probably approaching that all time high if it breaks and holds. I don't think we're coming down unless we see something in TradFi or just some major, you know, legal precedent case gets settled, new precedent set, and it scares people. 
Um, but I think between narrative and price action, right, we've been holding this, this high ETH and Bitcoin support for a pretty decent amount now. And we'll see some volatility, you know, three to 5% swings, but for the most part, they recover and then they shoot back up, right? And then they go a little bit higher. Um, and it just seems like, you know, no one, no one wants anything to go down on Twitter, the social sentiment, but then also on the market side. So I think while there are some, uh, some worrisome things in TradFi at this point, it's like, you just kind of got to let them, let them break because we've been, we've been worried forever, you know, almost a little bit yeah. too long at this point, nothing's happened. Whereas, you know, we've caught, caught some good trades in the upside, but I think until that happens, it's, you know, we got to embrace, we got at least another quarter of, you know, just pretty, pretty clear skies ahead, so to speak. Yeah, definitely. I think institutional money is going to be in this and so they have a reason not to be in it, right? That's kind of the scenario that we're looking at this. And obviously retail could pile into very few things that bother me that this, I, I think that we're going up at least until the OPEX June 21st. But a few things that do kind of bother me here are obviously decreasing volume as the price is pushing up in this area. Obviously it's bearish divergence, but doesn't necessarily mean anything sometimes because we do know that there is a stable coin printer out there that could defy all odds and get us to where we need to go. Um, the other thing is let's look at BTC USD on Coinbase. And again, I'm just being very nitpicky here. I'm thinking that we could put to, push to all time highs, but I mean, that could just be a little bit higher than this, or we could even break above this. But then if we retest it and we lose support, I think we're getting very close to the end of a move, or at least we're still trapped within a bigger bear flag that I'm seeing um, that spans, you know, February of 2021 to present day. Now, this thing could play out over the course of years, right? I mean, it could be 2026 before the time we see it touch the bottom of this parallel channel. Mm -hmm. just is what it is I'm, and if it does decide to break the next time it touches it then obviously it could be you know somewhat catastrophic catastrophic obviously it's going to go down ten thousand dollars i mean i think that'd be pretty bullish for a lot of people at that point but uh looking at this i want to see if this resistance holds uh if this resistance doesn't hold and we start putting close above and we're 82 83,000, then i totally abandon this theory um obviously we broke above it one time before and we got you know we reached went right back underneath it this was around february uh november 2021 so that's something that's going to be definitely on my eye and it's almost very similar to this right we had a we touched it which we did touch it back in i believe march or april we had a period of cooling off and then we broke above it a little bit of a higher high a new all-time high and then it came down very similar to here where obviously yes we got very close to touching it came down for a little bit and i think now we're going to put in a little bit of a higher high that is just my assessment looking at this on the technical analysis i don't think there's anything necessarily bad in bitcoin's way outside of you know financial turmoil in the global markets right there are there is that turmoil that does exist obviously we're starting to see some of these markets globally kind of not collapse but start to show major cracks i mean we saw india and mexico both have some of the biggest down days in probably like 15 years i believe we saw that germany is uh their unemployment rate increased significantly the amount of jobs that were lost in the past month i believe went from i think eight thousand expected to twenty five thousand. so obviously a smaller market but definitely very important and we're just going to probably see more pain out of Asia. The, they spent $61 billion, I think, in the last month on intervention, and that's in USD terms. We're seeing China, absolutely, their yen being devalued, but they're also selling off US debt to buy gold. So a lot of things out there that could definitely impact the US. I think a lot of it comes down to the treasury market being so significantly important. If they don't get that money in there, then I think that's going to be causing a lot of headwinds for the obviously equity market and crypto itself. That's the only thing I could see just that causes a lot of pain for Bitcoin. And it's just that now that it's part of traditional finance, uh, there, that's the thing that's going to pull it down. So that's my base case. Um, obviously this is another thing too. It doesn't have to happen and tether it's very weird. Uh, but every time we come down to this trend line on USD, USDT dominance, that does mark the height of a move in Bitcoin. And then obviously you do see a reversal pretty significantly, right? Uh, November, 2021, we should talk about that height over there. By the time we got to June 2022, obviously Bitcoin had put in a new low and then we double topped here when uh, SBF kind of fucked, uh, fucked up the market a little bit there. But uh, that's all I got. Is there anything else you want to add today? The market. 
I won't blame him entirely. There's definitely some other players in that. No, scenario. I know. It's just, it's just a funny way of phrasing it. It's like, yeah, he kind of did a thing. <laughs> yeah, he he just didn't say anything in the in the, in the plea deal. That's why he got 25 years, not four months. All right, I, I got nothing else. Anything you want to add today? No, nah, I think that was uh, I think that was a good way to leave it heading into the rest of the week, and uh, you know we'll we'll see what the market brings us. Definitely, I'm very excited for this month, and again, I'm looking forward to this opex because summer months are usually quiet. Maybe they're not this year. Maybe it's up only, or maybe it's down only. I don't think it's going to be sideways for, for for in the least bit, though. Uh, so we'll be back tomorrow. Um, House we have kind of a weird schedule this week, so we'll figure it out. Stay tuned on Twitter. But remember, like, comment, subscribe, follow us, share us out. We love doing this, and uh, we'll be back soon. All right. Take care, everyone, and uh, we'll see you all next time.